The last time we did a story in Dallas about someone who may have been wrongly convicted of a crime, his name was Len L. Jeter. When we caught up with him, he was in jail for life. Now we may have found another Len L. Jeter. A woman. Her name is Joyce Ann Brown, and when we caught up with her, she was also serving a life sentence, prosecuted by the same district attorney's office that put Jeter away. Back in 1980, two black women wearing jogging outfits walked into a fur store in Dallas owned by a Mr. and Mrs. Reuben Danzinger. One of the women pulled a gun, and they began stuffing furs into plastic garbage bags. The woman with the gun then shot and killed Mr. Danzinger. They both walked out of the store, got into a car, and made their escape. It didn't take long for the Dallas DA's office to find a suspect, and they found Joyce Ann Brown. They needed a conviction. They needed the pressure off. Two blacks in Dallas, Texas, in Texas, period, walked in and brought open daylight, shot and killed a businessman. Somebody was going to pay. I'm that somebody. She became that somebody shortly after police found the getaway car used in the robbery. It had been rented to a Joyce Ann Brown, a name familiar to Dallas police because she had previous arrests for prostitution. The vice cop showed her photo to Mrs. Danzinger just minutes after she'd been told her husband had died of his wounds. Mrs. Danzinger said, that's one of the women who robbed the store, the one who didn't have a gun. Days later, that same Joyce Ann Brown was sitting at home when she read in the newspaper she was wanted and had reportedly fled to Denver. She called a police officer she knew and said, I never fled anywhere. I'm sitting right here in Dallas. I said, I'm reading in the paper that they're looking for me for, a fur, for this fur robbery. And so I said, have you heard anything? And he says, I've heard rumor to the effect. He says, I don't know for sure. I said, well, look, I'm coming in. I don't so know. They were showing you a picture in the street, but nobody ever came around to your house. Nobody never came, never called. Never came and never called. And vice officers knew my number. When she went to the police, Joyce Brown was arrested on the spot for capital murder. But in the next few days, police realized that the car had been rented to a Joyce Ann Brown, all right, but a Joyce Ann Brown of Denver, Colorado, a completely different person. She told police she'd loaned the car to a friend, Renee Taylor, who had a long arrest record for, among other things, stealing furs. Taylor had fled Dallas, but sure enough, a search of her apartment turned up the murder weapon and other evidence, even a phone book open to the retail fur page. Taylor's fingerprints were all over the car and all over the crime scene, but police found no physical evidence linking Joyce Ann Brown of Dallas to the crime. No evidence, says Joyce Brown, because she says she was here, trying to put her life together, working as a receptionist at, coincidentally, another fur store, Coslow's, about three miles from the Danziger store. A Coslow employee, Judy Ponder, and her husband, Bruce, were among many who later testified that Joyce was at her desk that day near the time of the robbery. Was there anything special about that day, May 6, 1980? It was my birthday. <laughs> so the Ponders had reason to remember that day, and they remember having a chat with Joyce and leaving her shortly before 1 p.m., about the time the robbery at the Danzingers was starting. You, you get the license plate, right? Right. And then what do you do? Uh, Ken Offshay, a wholesale florist, saw the two robbers leave the first store, noted the license plate number, got a good look at one of the robbers, and went into the store to investigate. Walked inside, and then Ms. Danziger, I didn't know her name at the time, came out screaming, saying that there'd been a robbery and her husband was shot. So I, I went in the back with her, saw her husband laying face down in the pool of blood and decided the best thing to do would get the police. That 911 call came in at 1.16. Off, she says, he saw the robbers leave the store about four minutes earlier, putting the getaway at about 1.12. Sandy Beam, a Coslo employee, testified she was clocking back in from lunch when she had a lengthy face-to-face -face conversation with Joyce Ann Brown. What time was that? Beam's time card reads 1.19. So if the two robbers fled the store at about 1.12 and 
when Joyce Brown was seen sitting at her desk at 119. Was it possible for her to get from Danziger's and back to Coslow's in about seven minutes, changing clothes in the process? Could she have ducked out of the shop, changed clothes, got over to the Danziger's store, robbed it, made a getaway, changed clothes again, and returned in the time available? No. I don't think she could have done it without the clothes changes. That's some of the worst traffic in Dallas at, she, at that time of day. We decided to try it ourselves at the same time of day to see if we could make it in seven minutes, taking the shortest possible route. We hit the first light and we're making the second light. It looks as if we'll make the fourth light, which is an unusual break. So it's a fairly clear run so far. In this kind of lunchtime traffic. Okay, how stop it. How much do we do it? Eight twenty. Eight minutes twenty. But Ken Offshea says the robbers didn't take that route onto the highway, but made a right turn out of the parking lot. What would that do to you if you were going to where Coslow's is? Well, it would put you in the opposite direction from where you wanted to go. Why so the case right? against Joyce Ann Brown seemed weak, but shortly before it went to the jury, Assistant District Attorney Norm Kinney, who told us he was barred from discussing the case, called a surprise witness named Martha Jean Bruce. Bruce, who was awaiting trial on an attempted murder charge back in 1980, testified that while she and Joyce Brown were cellmates in the county jail, Joyce had bragged that she'd taken part in the first door robbery. The DA's investigator, Artie Christian, found her well, story uh, convincing. After I talked to her a little bit in detail, she began to tell me some things that indicated to me that she would have had to have talked to someone involved in that crime because of the facts that she had about uh, the way the furs was supposedly uh, uh, bagged up when, uh, when they left the scene. And uh, Martha Jean Bruce had that information. She knew that they were in plastic bags. But she could have read that in the newspapers. Weeks before Bruce was interviewed, the Dallas Morning News reported that the robbers stuffed plastic bags filled with furs into a car and sped away. A lot of that was out in, in, the, in the papers. Well, I don't know. Uh, I don't recall it being in the papers at that time. And uh, uh, I had no indication that Martha Bruce even had any, any uh, exposure to the news accounting of uh, the way it was reported. But she did. Bruce admitted in her court testimony that she'd followed the case in the newspapers. Question. Joyce Brown didn't come in and talk about the guy getting shot and killed. You read about it in the paper, didn't you? Answer. Yes, sir. It was in the paper. Question. Miss Bruce, you have an attempted murder for a sentence of five years, two years probation for shoplifting, and a misdemeanor for shoplifting. Are those the only times that you've been convicted? Answer, yes. But that was a lie. Just six months before she testified against Joyce Brown, Bruce had been convicted of filing a false crime report to the police. That came as a surprise to Dan Peeler and Craig Hernke, two of the jurors who had believed Martha Bruce's testimony. If I knew then what I know now, I certainly wouldn't have voted guilty. And with the evidence we have now, there's no reason why she shouldn't have a new trial. Did Assistant D.A. Kinney promise Martha Jean Bruce anything in return for her testimony? Both swore that no deal had been made to reduce her sentence. Yet just weeks after the trial, the DA's office wrote a letter to the Texas Parole Board asking that Bruce's sentence be reduced. The governor commuted her sentence and Bruce walked free after having served a little more than a year of her five-year sentence. And when he put Martha Bruce on the stand, I said, you stupid fool. He don't care whether you're innocent or guilty. All he wants is a conviction. And that's what the prosecutor got. Joyce Brown was convicted in October of 1980 and sentenced to life in state prison, ineligible for parole until the year 2000. But the story didn't end there. 
In 1984, her attorney, Kerry Fitzgerald, later joined by co-counsel Jack Strickland, moved for a new trial and requested the DA's files on both Martha Jean Bruce and their client, Joyce Ann Brown. And what happened when you asked for the file? They said they didn't have it. Didn't have it. And they are saying, I believe, they've lost Joyce Ann Brown's file now and they've lost Martha Jean Bruce's file. How common is that? It's not common. I've never had it happen before. It's not uncommon to say we've misplaced a file and be able to find it after they've searched some period of time, but just simply to have lost all record of it, the original or a duplicate, I've never seen it happen. It's extraordinary. Their petition for a new trial was denied. Meantime, Renee Taylor, the trigger woman, had been captured in Michigan and returned to Dallas, where she pled guilty to murder. She swore in an affidavit that Joyce Ann Brown was... I will remain here for the rest of my life. Really a vegetable. I have a family that supports me. I have a daughter that needs me, and I'm guilt-free. I can lay down at night and sleep. Sometimes I sleep 14, 15, 16 hours straight. I don't have to dream about a crime. I don't have to dream about seeing a man shot down like a dog, because I wasn't there. Then just three weeks ago, a stunning turnaround. At a hearing in Dallas, the district attorney's office admitted that their star witness, Martha Bruce, had given false testimony by not revealing her previous conviction for lying, and that the DA's office should have known about that conviction. Judge Ron Chapman then recommended to the Court of Criminal Appeals that Joyce Ann Brown be granted a new trial. Joyce believes she'd be free on bail within a few days. Well, the first thing I'm going to do is spend some time with my daughter. And that very night, I'm going to sleep in the bed with my mama. <laughs> I've been waiting on that day a long time. But she'll have to wait even longer. Three days later, the appeals court denied her bail request until it has a chance to consider the recommendation for a new trial. No one knows how long that could take. So tonight... Like every night for the past nine years, Joyce Ann Brown's in jail.